Hi, hi Simone. Hi, Layla. <laughs> and uh, hi, all of you who made it out in the scorching heat to sit with us in a building with no air conditioning. Um, really happy to be discussing Simone's work today, um, the lore of the future. <laughs> uh, so we're going to get into it. Um, I, I, I want to open up by just, you know, congratulating you on the show. It looks great. Thank um, you. And I see so many, so much continuity in your practice, at least from what I've observed over the years. And um, I'm really happy to dig into the themes of this show because I feel like we have a lot of conceptual crossover. So I, you know, thank you for inviting me to be in conversation with you. Um, yeah, do you wanna? Well, I'm curious to know about the continuity. If we can jump in there. <laughs> what are you seeing? I don't um, see well, I think we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Um, but I want to ask you about the title, just to start us off, um, The Lore of the Future. Uh, what, what, what is behind the title? Why did you title the exhibition The Lore of the Future? Um, I also noticed that just like reading through the Patti Smith article that you have available upstairs, that there's this line where she talks about the word nigger becoming archaic and language becoming archaic and like kind of dissolving as we progress toward the future. And so I'm wondering if, if I wondered if the line in that interview had anything to do with the title. No, but it, maybe it sank in some way. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's happening with the show is that a lot of the, it's, it's a narrative, but it's a narrative that's you know told in a non-linear way through where a sculpture might engage with a song and the song then engages with a silver gelatin print and then that print then engages with the painting and so on and so forth, you know? Um, and so The Lore of the Future is actually a line from the song from the record that we made. Um, and it's, it's the song that I wrote called The Surrender to the Savage and there's a line that you're, The Lore of the Future is untold. And so I was thinking about, maybe we'll get in this, more into this later, but just quickly, when I was thinking about, you know, just this exhibition and concept and ideas behind it, um, it's really rooted in this, I guess, maybe just me getting older in a way and like looking back on like the kind of like political urgency that you feel in your 20s. Um, I told you this, you know, a few days ago, it's where I realized at some point, probably around the time I was turning 25, like, oh, this isn't going away, like this racism thing. It's not going away in my lifetime. I'm just contributing, making a small contribution towards making it better and the next generation will do their part. But it's really like, it was like, you know, I, I dreamed that the future, I would see the future. I'm not going to see the future. I'm just gonna see something that's incrementally, incrementally better than what it was when I was born. That's what I will see when I die. Um, and so it's the lore of the future. We're just working towards Something, you know. <laughs> um, so I know a lot of that is connected to this history of the band, the Maroons, um, that was based here in the 70s, or here, San Francisco in the 70s. And, you know, there is, as you mentioned, you know, thinking about the future, speculations of, of the future, and kind of imagining a way to escape into the future as a black person or a future without race, racism, essentially. Um, I, want, I want you to talk a little bit about your, you know, the Maroons as an inspiration and kind of the center point for the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing that people don't know is that I made up the um, they are, you know, a product of my imagination. Um, so ask the question again. Yeah. You think about it this, if you understand that. Yes, like a, so, so it's a speculation of the future. And so the world of the past looking at, you know, the future. It, yeah, so it's like uh, you're a speculative kind of thinking about what it would be like to escape your current reality. Um, and, you know, just thinking about fugitivity and refusal, you were speculating on this idea that you could escape into something. And so you imagine this band, the Maroons, that not, that don't exist in the future, but you know they existed in San Francisco in the 1970s as part of your kind of speculative 
reality. The battery is dead. Oh. <laughs> um, so, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the things I was saying was I was like very politically engaged in my 20s and there was a group of women of color and they told us to like, you know, imagine the future that we wanted to see and then work towards building that. Um, and then I always struggled to do that, you know, in my 20s. Like, I was like, really, what I really was saying, I think I was taking it too seriously. Now I can't imagine the future that I want to see, but I, when I was thinking about the runes, it, again, it's still rooted, it's kind of like autobiographical, but not, right? So it's rooted in that where it's like, I don't really know where the future is, so where they escape to is not the place I can make. Mm -hmm. I could only make, you know, their circumstances and why they decided. So in your imagination of the Maroons um, and their escape from rock and roll uh, and you know, cultural production, what, why did you imagine they wanted to escape? And where did that come from in terms of your, your, your physical reality and what you experience um, in real life mm -hmm. that connects to their uh, actual escape? and disappearance yeah yeah i mean that's complex and one thing is that i started thinking about the maroons in the midst of covid lockdown uh -huh. um so like there was obvious <laughs> there was something i wanted to escape you know just the kind of like i actually had fun during lockdown i had a lot of fun but at the same time it was socially lacking there was a lot that you know could have wanted after a year or so and um, so that was all, I think it was about literally wanting to escape like the literal just pandemic type circumstances. Um, but then racially or living in the body that I live in, I frequently want to just escape, you know, the conditions that I have to deal with every day um, in, you know, multitude of ways. Um, and going back to this realization, you know, that I had around 25 that I would never escape, but it's really inescapable. Um, you know, if I walk down the street, I'm going to confront it. If I go into the grocery store, I'm sure as hell going to confront it. Um, you know, the more I engage with people in society, the more I have to deal with it. And so, you know, I often wish for that place where there would be none of that, and that would be the place, you know, that the Maroons ended up in. So before we get to the where they ended up, um, <laughs> uh, I want to dig a little bit more into the concept of escape, um, because I think that there's a, it's, it's really kind of pregnant, right? Um, I think even you know, just in the world as a black person is one layer. And in, in, in the world, in the art world as a black person is another layer. And, you know, I think that we are constantly confronting and navigating anti-blackness. And I think it's a real desire to want to escape that every day and realizing that that's not a possibility. And so, I'm curious how you imagine the Maroons kind of living in that reality in the 70s and what, what escape means to you from like that place. From the place of the Maroons in the 70s? Yeah, from the place of the Maroons of the 70s and mm -hmm. from your place in all of the kind of anti-blackness in, in, in the, the mini strata that we exist in. One of the things that I imagine about the Maroons, I imagine them not having the same language that I have. 
So that's mm -hmm. even why the song became like Surrender the Savage, where I was like, oh, I think this is a good idea. And I was like, but can I use the word savage today? It would have been okay in the 70s to do that, but like I have issues just with it today. Mm -hmm. And then it was, a, you know, so I actually spent months and months like thinking about like how they would like term, you know, that way that blackness is perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I just decided, yes, they would only see it, like, that that's probably the only word that they could use to describe it would be the savage, and they would, you know, be escape, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen to them. Um, so yeah, I, I mainly thought about it in terms of like, language that they would use, um, because it was something where I was really trying to be deliberate, but make it look like, you know, just so easy, um, but just really deliberate and like, not rooting the, not letting the language be so much today, let it, having the language be that of the past. And in the 70s, like, you know, the language we have now is beginning to emerge, but it was like so nascent, so, and it wasn't widespread. You know, black was a revolutionary word at that time, mm -hmm. not, you know, the many, many different words that we have today. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the Maroons were like a punk, punk rock band, and uh, they existed. I think you say in the intersections of punk rock and black power, um, and so yeah, black. The term black was very revolutionary for them, and I imagine that even if they, even if then the term anti-blackness didn't exist, it certainly existed for them as a feeling. Okay. It was an embodied, it was an embodied feeling. Um, that they experienced through the song Rock and Roll Nigger by Patti Smith, right? And so that was, that, that's what kind of catapulted them out of what, you know, the, their cultural production there, at least, you know, in your imagination, right? Yeah, yeah so just going back to COVID lockdown, um, um, I've listened to rock music my whole life. It's something that actually got my parents together. My parents grew up with, I grew up with my parents, you know, listening to rock music in our house um, in a somewhat depoliticized way. Um, and so I've always been aware, I've just always been aware of Patti Smith's Rock and Roll Nigger, but it was a song that I avoided. I avoided her. I read M Train when I was in New York, and I didn't like it because I, I just have a bias against her, but I read the book. Um, and. When I was in lockdown, you know, there's just again these endless days with nothing to do. I started listening to things like through YouTube mainly that I hadn't listened to in the past. And I was listening to YouTube's recommendations, you know, like when they would like say, oh, listen to this next. And only, why would I listen to what YouTube wants me to listen to next? But it's like, oh, who knows how long I'm going to be in this circumstance? Why not listen to Pearl Jam Unplugged, which is something that I, I really liked it, actually. I really liked it. Um, <laughs> So that's how, and somehow like a Patti Smith thing came up. And, oh wait, Patti Smith Because of the Night, which I actually think is a beautiful song, but I, I still can't stand her, so I just listen to the 10,000 Maniacs song if I want to, version if I want to hear that song. And so then I was like, well, maybe this is the time. You know, I have nothing better to do. Maybe I'm going to listen to this song I've known about since childhood and avoided. And I listened to it. And I still, you know, had that distaste for her, and the distaste is rooted in just, you know, the ignorance, the anti-blackness, ignorance and the co-opting of culture and everything that's so deeply embedded in everything about that song. Um, but I listened to it. And once I, and there were parts that were actually like enjoyable sonically. Um, it's no because of the night, but you know, she didn't have Springsteen to help her out there. And so, you know, it's, that's where it started like growing for me. So it's also the Maroons were having my reaction. Um, but I also, you know, because they're a fictional group and because they were then like as her contemporaries, they would have a much stronger reaction. It would have been new, it would have been fresh. Um, there wouldn't have been this whole culture where, you know, niggers on the radio 50 million times or, you know, not the radio, but, you know, like where people are listening to it and consuming it. It wasn't that sort of scenario, it would have been shocking even in an article i don't know if you noticed that the, like white interviewer is questioning patty smith's use of the word like it was controversial at her time where even a white person was like why are you doing this um 
because um yeah <laughs> who here has heard patty smith's rock and roll nigger i mean i think a lot of people haven't mm-hmm. yeah do you want to walk walk everyone through what yeah, the experience yeah. was so maybe to it's that? a it's probably iconic so i also have to say that i grew up in and as, as, as the descendant of black folks in the rock and roll, I got into punk rock. And growing up in the Bay Area, I, I made my mom take me to a punk show at the bottom of the hill in San Francisco when I was 12 years old. Changed my life, right? Um, it was actually Slater Kinney on their first tour. I cut my hair the next day. They had these, like, they were girlfriends. They had like asymmetrical haircuts. I really like, my mom screamed. Um, Cause I was like this high on this side, that low on the other side. It's cute. And, um, <laughs> So it's, it's, it's kind of, I think, an iconic song for punk kids, especially because it's supposed, she's supposed to be the godmother of punk rock. You know, she had her edge. She had her, you know, controversial, you know, that was part of her trying to be controversial. So anyway, it's a song that she wrote in 19, it came out in 1978. She probably wrote it, you know, a year before. And she basically was aiming to redefine the word nigger to mean art mutant punk people like herself. Like she said that Mick Jagger was a nigger. Um, and she, I don't remember what people she named. She, oh, Jackson Pollock in the song she says is a nigger. Um, and she just really wanted it to be like a word that she could own and claim. Um, and for me, it was just kind of like a part of maybe even not the beginning, definitely, but definitely not the end. A part of this like white on avant garde tradition of aligning themselves with either literal or metaphorical blackness to express disaffection with, you know, their own dominant culture, um, but done in a way that was so, like, violently, ignorantly hateful and abusive. Um, like in the article, she talks about calling, like, a little black kid nigger on the street. It's like, imagine being a kid in, like, this dirty white woman with, like, baggy clothes, like, calls you, like, it's just like, I can't even imagine what that kid was thinking, like. You know, like, I mean, wouldn't be the first. True, but still, (laughs) still. um, So yeah, (laughs) that's that's a lot of it. It's rooted in a lot of my own response. Yeah, so so they, you imagine that they heard this song, and then what? You imagine the Maroons heard the song, and then what? They realized it was over. Like, it was fully over, like, you know. Um, but I also... So, what was over? Well, okay, so it's, it's at the same time I was listening to Patti Smith, you know, like I said, I was listening to Pearl Jam and Plug, but I was also going back into the past and really spending lockdown listening to a lot of things that I hadn't listened to before. Like, you know, exploring different parts of rock and roll history, because I am, like, a big music nerd. I love rock music. Um, but even listening to it for a lifetime, there's still plenty of things that I haven't, you know, really, really listened to closely or, you know, at all. Um, that I know about. And so I listen to a lot of different things. And um, like, I love Guns N' Roses, um, just as a band. And so, and I also love the Soulsters, which was Sam Smith's gospel band that I think like Joe Cocker totally ripped off. And so I was wondering, like, how do we get from the Soulsters to Guns N' Roses? And Guns N' Roses, people tend to ignore this, but Slash is black. Um, he is a black musician and his music kind of, his guitar playing kind of makes the band, right? And so um, how do we get from to, the, to that level of like black rock and roll music to, you know, the kind where the black person's really just kind of in the background, hair blowing in the wind while you know, some guy whines. Um, how do we do that, um, you know, politically, culturally, intellectually? <laughs> like, how do we make that big leap? Um, so, and I was, again, like, again, I listened to Joe Cocker, I hate Joe Cocker, too. Um, but he, he, yeah, well, but he really is ripping off Sam Smith, like, I mean, Sam Cook, sorry. Um, but the influence of the, what I'm just going to call African-American sound, and I mean that in a very specific way, my descend from people who were enslaved in this country, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, and you know the culture that my forebearers created. Um, 
as opposed, you know, there's different types of ways of being black in this country. But the culture that my forebears created, it was just like, how could it become something that is now so associated, like it's basically associated with white supremacy, like today. Um, it's so, it's coded so white that it's like, pretty much okay to, you know, connect rock and roll with white supremacy, and how did that happen? Um, and how would, you, how would you react to that if you were, in, you were a black musician who was still playing rock music into the 70s, which is a little late, because most black musicians dropped out in the 60s, um, late 60s, but like, how would you feel about that? Like, if you were still holding on, then all of a sudden, you know, you see Leonard Skinner flying their Confederate flags, you know, well, how would you feel? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hearing you and, you know, thinking about what the Maroons might have been feeling, because I think we experienced that not in, in the same kind of large cultural sweep that the Maroons or any other Black bands that existed then might have felt, but, um, you know, I'm thinking about, I think we talked about this, but, um, one thing that's coming to mind is Arthur Jaffa talking about uh, white rock and roll musicians and kind of the best, mus uh, the best rock and roll musicians being good only because they humbled themselves to black music. And, um, you know, I'm curious, well, and then also it makes me think about this kind of internet dialogue that's happening about white co-optation and how comfortable many white folks are naming when they are influenced by East Asian cultures or Latin American cultures, but when it comes to anything that they might have that that might have been influenced by Black culture, it's something that they came up with or invented, or you know, it's never it's never connected to to Black folks because there is an inherent anti-Blackness, right? And so, I mean, you can think of like any, any random like white musician, for example, having, you know, Japanese influence, for example, very easy to name. However, you know, when anything is taken from black culture, it can't be named. So I'm, you know, I'm curious about like how that lives in the work that you created upstairs and, um, you know, both in the, the, the images and the, the sculpture and a lot of what this kind of imaginary speculative rock and roll space that the Maroons live in, like wh how that looks and feels. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one thing that I did is I literally named the people. Um, so um, right above the couch, there's a black on black painting where literally like black rock and roll people are named like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Howlin' Wolf and Robert Johnson and Otis Blackwell and you know, tons of people, right? Um, and not all of them necessarily would have been like traditional rock people. Some of them were more like straight up blues people. Like there was a point where I was really wondering if I should even put Robert Johnson on there, but I was like, no, he influenced so many right rock and rollers that he basically is rock and roll, even though he would have never, you know, his style wouldn't have necessarily have brushed up on that himself. Um, so yeah, that's one of the most important things is I really named that and I put it over the couch where you sit, where you listen to the record intentionally because I didn't want people, I, didn't, I wanted to make sure that people were not able to listen to that record like divorced from that history where you literally had to be under you know, the weight of those names um, when you listen to the Maroons record and you know just thinking about rock and roll being based like you know a, a kind of evolution of blues and many of those musicians were somewhere in between blues and rock and roll right that's the lineage of it um, I kind of see rock a uh, rock and roll for black folks as that kind of imagined escape in thinking about fugitivity, it feels like a musical expression 
that allowed for, and you know, thinking about your song, Surrender to the Savage, you say, can you feel the rapture, right? Can you feel, you're talking about rage. And so I, I wonder how you connect the song to a lot of that kind of felt rage and anger and how you bring that history of, of blackness and, and rock and roll to your own music and how you think about that as this kind of expression of that rage or this idea of escape, being escaping into the music in some way. Um, well, one, it's, it's really about tapping into the impulse of kind of like punk music and punk music wasn't, isn't all, you know, anger and rage, there's plenty of happy. Um, there, there is happy. <laughs> um, but the anger and rage part is a big part of it as well. Um, and so part of it was just kind of like, you know, again, tapping into just like that particular type of rock expression. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, mixing it with, you know, the story of the Maroons, it was, I think, when someone wants to escape, there's a strong emotional response, right? Um, it could be fear, right? It could be, you know, a lot of things, strong emotional responses could inspire the desire to escape, but I think a lot of it, you know, especially for, in the kind of maroon scenario, it's like, I can't deal with this anymore. It's like, it is inspired by a kind of rage there desire to escape. It's not like they were just you know, sad and forlorn and rock and roll abandoned them. You know, they were angry that it, they felt like it had been taken away. Um, and so that rage is, you know, part of their story. Do you think about rock and roll in your own, or your, you know, punk music, do you think about that as an expression of rage or as a, a means to escape? Because in this, this exhibition, there's a, you know, we talked about it, there being this theme of like imagining what it would be like to escape the realities of anti-blackness or racism. It's kind of an interesting question. I've not thought about it. I do think about punk as like a form of like a very tight, like a very specific type of like youthful aggression. Um, and I think about it, maybe it is about a type of escape. You know, um, I think at one point in time, perhaps when the Maroons were around, it would have been a much more radical form of escape. Now it's, you know, very, it's like a gesture towards escape, you know, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> from, you know, I mean, like, you know, dominant forces, no matter what sort of race or identity you have, if you take that on, um, you know, it's not particularly radical um, today or probably, you know, definitely not necessarily in the 90s, probably by like 85, it was no longer radical so much. Um, it was pop, you know, by then. Um, but I, th I think it's still kind of, it embodies, it. I think it symbolizes a desire to escape. I don't think it's like an end point or it's, well, for some people, maybe it is an end point. I don't think it's necessarily an end point. Yeah, I mean, even thinking about the earliest rock and roll musicians, uh, you know, Sister Rosetta Tharp or Ma Rainey, I like, I imagine that they saw that as a means to escape or like yeah. as a way to find a kind of freedom especially, through vocal expression. Yeah, especially if you don't know them, they are like basically queer black women who are some of the, really the first rock and rollers out there um, who picked up guitars and were singing songs, touring, doing their own thing in a time where um, black people really didn't travel, especially not black women. Um, they were really pioneers um, in a really critical way. So for them, yeah, I definitely think it was, um, well, I think we're using escape like liberation now, but like escape in a very like liberatory sense. How are you? How are you thinking about <laughs> escape in the context well, no, of this? I, I just realized that's how I'm using it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so rock and roll is like a liberatory practice, right? For a lot of those, they it was at least for a lot of those folks. Yeah. And especially, just imagine like you know these old junk joints, you know, at the end of these dusty old country roads in the Black Belt. Like that yeah. was literally the only place those people could be free. They were, you know, 
serving people all day long. They were working in cotton fields. They were, you know, mm, yeah. doing these things. And all of a sudden, on their weekends, they could go to a place and sing and dance. You know, it was very much a liberatory space. And so to kind of bring it back to Patti Smith, so on your record, <laughs> on your record, you do the cover of Rock and Roll Nigger. Yes. So was that a kind of, were you liberating the song in the word nigger from Patti Smith, from her co-optation of both the word and the, the expression of rock and roll? I don't think I liberated the song. I mean, I think... You know, it might have been a slim, very tiny gesture towards doing something like that. But I think it was more just like really like an in-your-face, tongue-in-cheek thing. Because as I listened to the song, and really I listened to it more during lockdown. I have not listened to it again since then. I, I don't need to. Um, her version. Yeah, yeah. her version. Yeah. Um, but, you know, she talks about like, you know, wanting to be outside of society. And again, it's really about wanting to be something like a black person where she's, you know, on the edge, and I'm like, these people don't even have to try, and they're what she wanted to be. Like, mm -hmm. don't even have to try. Just put it on a different, like, put it on the right, the right voice and the right body. It's the meaning becomes something more potent. Yeah, I mean, for those of you who don't know the all of the lyrics of the song, she's basically self-identifying as a nigger in many ways, right? And. Uh, there's this, I guess, incantation, I would call it like a chant where she's saying outside of society, outside of society over and over again. Yeah, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but listen to that and think like this woman who kind of lives in this perceived and uh, like permissible space of whiteness that is not policed and not boundaried. What does she know about wanting to live outside of society? Like, what does that even mean coming from her? And, you know, I think that even just hearing that kind of fueled a, a rage in my body, <laughs> just listening to it. And then hearing your version, it just sounds like it fits. Yeah. Yeah, because some of us don't have a choice. Like, we're we either have to try to fit in society or we're outside no matter what. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the concept of this show came from that feeling, right? I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but the feeling of wanting to live outside of society in some way and where that, where that started. Oh. I feel like maybe I kind of hinted at it, but I can't remember exactly what I said. Um, I think it had something to do with nature and escaping to this like pastoral landscape. Oh, no, that was kind of the reverse of that. Um, the earliest, earliest, earliest things that became connected to the Ramones, 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 the Maroons were rooted in just experiences going to residencies where they happen to, you know, they tend to be in these like, remote spaces, um, very rural areas. And, you know, nature's great and everything. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> no one can disagree with that. <laughs> like, you know, it's, yeah, it's really cool. But like, th there's always a struggle to like be in those sorts of environments. Um, as a black person because the type of people who, you know, generally like thrive in those spaces are the type of people who are basically seeking to escape people like myself. That's where they find themselves liberated. Um, so when you kind of show up and you look like me, it's, you're usually not welcome um, in those spaces. And so Going back to the Maroons, when I started, you know, so that's, you know, a few residencies later, that's in the back of my head. Um, I don't know where they ended up. I don't know that they ended up, like, in the forest or the woods, you know. They might have just gone to Toledo. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of removed. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know where they ended up. But there's, there's a, you know, just kind of, like, I think there's a conflict there. And there's also just... The same conflict, I think, of being, like I said, again, from 
the heritage that I'm from, I can go to the deep south to a rural landscape in a few seconds and go hang out with relatives anytime I want. But again, those situations are fraught. And also because the people who live there, especially in the south, they're usually the descendants of people who were enslaved on the land. There's a lot of poverty. You know, Edwards, like everyone who could escape, escaped because that was no longer, a, like never been a space where black people could be free, but it's definitely not one now. Um, food deserts, but food deserts where you have to drive 50 miles to the grocery store sort of situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Conflicted. Yeah. yeah. You know, and the Maroons, <laughs> although in this exhibition they exist in a fictional space, there are the real Maroons. And so I'm curious how the history of the Maroons and the, you know, escaping enslavement and, and you know, basically uh, seeking freedom and also, you know, uh, in, engaging in war to fight for their freedom um, in, in continents around the world. I'm curious how that, that history kind of fueled the, this idea for the Maroons, the band. Um, it influenced it a lot, where I imagine the Maroons, the band, you know, looking towards those people as, you know, role models. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, just to expand upon what Leila just said, um, the Maroons, Maroons were named were, were named for runaway slaves. Sometimes people ran away, like literally the second they were taken out of the handcuffs and they were landed on this hemisphere, they ran. Um, some people endured a few years, many years of bondage and ran away later. Um, but it was basically the name for people who refused to be enslaved in a time where that was really the only option um, for black people, period. Um, and people created their own societies. They really did create spaces where they could thrive outside of, again, a capitalism that demanded their enslavement. Um, some people... merged with indigenous groups, other people stayed to themselves. Um, some people rented themselves out as free labor when it was safe to do so. Some people had no engagement with white people. Again, they just you know, avoided and lived you know, without leaving a trace because if they were caught, they would become enslaved again. Um, and so yeah, it was very much about looking towards those sort of people as the model of like, you know, they found liberation in a time where it was virtually impossible for any black person on this planet to be free. And the Maroons found it through rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Your Maroons, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so really the theme of this entire exhibition, although it's named The Lore of the Future, it seems like the idealistic future is escaping to freedom, right? This, that's the, the future that you're imagining. I mean, and I want to... I want you to talk about the, one of the pieces up there that is a symbol of escape or uh, bondage, the, the lovers, that metal piece, which is my personal favorite in Thank the show. You. That's yeah. mine too. I have wounds and I'm still covering it up. It's like it sliced my wrist and I'm not into the slit wrist aesthetic, so I'm wearing a Band-Aid. Um, yeah, so the lovers is a... Uh, sculpture made out of concertina razor wire, and it's basically just two interlocking like spheres where each sphere is made out of like three, you know, I guess rounds of wire to kind of define the shape and then they're put together. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just kind of about this idea of a, like, you know, a duo where literally they will cut anything. <laughs> that comes close to them, like where they're just moving through the world in this space where, you know, I think there's probably a beautiful, more poetic way to say it, it's not coming to mind, but literally, yeah, they're moving in tandem, but anything that potentially threatens them will be sliced open, including the artist. <laughs> Does that, so are, did you title it after Felix Gonzalez Torres is the lovers, or is that, was that influence at all? Which is also one of my favorite pieces. So yeah, kind of, it's like it's definitely a totally different work, but I yes. thought about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think both imply death. That's true too. That's true too. 
lovers like that would that would survive? Yeah. yeah, I mean the the idea of Felix Gonzalez Torres is um, the lovers is that the clocks will run out, and your idea of the lover or your concept in the kind of the the razor wire is that anyone who comes in the path of the lovers will die, and so it's not the lovers who will die; it's anyone who comes into contact with them, and so instead of the clocks being, you know, eventually dying or facing inevitable death, you you give the lovers some power and um, the ability to protect, to self-protect. I wonder if since they're timeless. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the sculpture, the bust, Nigger Rex, who is covered in Dax hair grease, which is now melted all over the place. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. Um, it was an idea I had to like, you know, as I invented the world of the Maroons in my head, there's a lot that it, it isn't in the gallery, um, but that was my idea for like making a different record cover is just like a piece of ephemera, like, oh, maybe this was like, you know, their first record or, you know, the cover of this. Um, and it's literally a bust. It started out as a crown of hair grease. And because this post-summer season has been so incredibly warm, you know, it's just, I knew it was going to fall. That's why it's done. Um, but it, it fell very dramatically and beautifully. Um, and so it was just kind of about this crown, you know, that could never, never really stay up. And why is it covered in Dax? Because um, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what kind of crown would a would a would a nigger have? You know, what would it be made out of? What would it look like? You and know, it, sitting it, next to the lovers, though. <laughs> you know, I immediately think of like crown of thorns. Not try to connect um, it to the, to Jesus, mm -hmm. but um, you know, just thinking about the crown, and you made it this. You turned it into soft material, like malleable material. Yeah, Just... I didn't, I, it's not a Jesus reference at all, no. at least not in my head, <laughs> but um, it really was about a crown that would never be able to stay. You know, mm -hmm. It wasn't really made to be a crown and it really was never gonna stay on anyway. And yeah. maybe it's about, you know, disempowerment in sort of the dominant society sense, mm -hmm. you know? across from a way to move through them is somewhat, you know, I won't say empowered, I don't know if the lovers are empowered, but, you know, in a defensive position. Thank you. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions? I know there was a, a lot, a lot of content shared just now, but really open to cross dialogue. Becky. But it's my Chris. Like, you know, if I just think about my, I think about my own, like, just say that's like matrilineal family history. My grandmother grew up, well, say my great grandmother um, wasn't able to get an education past the sixth grade because the Negro schools in her, you know, rural southern town didn't go up that high. Um, and she did a lot, you know, whatever she did, you know, domestic work, whatever work. My grandmother grew up picking cotton so that because my great grandmother didn't want the same thing to happen to her, so she made all of her kids pick cotton so they could get a Greyhound bus to go to the big town where they could get a high school education. My mother got to go to college. I get to sit here here talking to you today about the same story, right? So it's incremental, um, but that's four generations. So 
thousands of years? Probably. Probably thousands. I think the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade is that powerful and that deep that it will be thousands of years. I think you are more optimistic than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Are there any other questions? Yeah. so I think this movie is made and it's done. Um, but I do, the ideas that are in there, just the idea of Maroon Edge, you know, and this escape, like they're definitely still with me and something that I'm going to move forward with. I'm not sure, you know, how it'll show up, but the Maroons, you know, themselves, just, no, there's no tour, there's no record, um, no, no follow-up record, but, um, I think, yeah, the idea is, you know, my thought about the ideas, and my ongoing thought, and my changing, you know, developing ideas about this will show up in my next work. But it takes us back to continuity and how we were going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, before we get into that, <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit about how your musical influences and um, you know, you're trained as a filmmaker and you work primarily in installation. I mean, of course, you have these still images up, but I'm curious how music has in- influenced your spatial sensibilities, if it has in any way, uh, because music seems to be a big part of your practice. And from what I've observed, I think music has a kind of center point in all of your work. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it really does. Um, It depends on the project, you know, but I think like a lot of the things that I've done probably for the past six or seven years have really started out with the song. So I even plan, it's not even just about planning space, it's planning an entire exhibition and the works around songs. Like, you know, the lovers that's upstairs right now, it actually started from a song, the very first Maroon song that I wrote was called Razor Wire Hearts. It was scrapped for a lot of different reasons. So it actually directly referred um, to a song that I just didn't end up wanting to record. Um, so it's, 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 it's about space, but it's also about like, the little artworks are becoming informed by these things that I make, or the music, <clears throat> the music that I make. And so I, I guess working as a filmmaker and you know sound being its own, character and um you know force in any given visual narrative how do you imagine music playing the same role in your installations especially this one and you know i guess to angela hennessy's point um how might this be a moment where you kind of continue that work in future installations if at all, but you know, I think music is, seems to be a, a huge part of it. 
and how you shape space. Yeah. Can, sorry, can you repeat the question? I got tied up in a lot of different thoughts in like too many directions. In my <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I'm still focus. thinking about <laughs> music, your, your spatial sensibility and how you think about a layout and uh, placement of work um, as an installation artist and practice, your practice as a filmmaker connected to that envisioning installation as a spatial narrative. It's spatial, but it's also embodied. And I think that's really why I started moving towards it um, was because, you know, visual art can do a lot to move people, but there's something just about sound. Like it literally enters your body. I mean, of course, you know, light enters your cornea and if you want to get technical about that, but like sound literally, you can feel it matching your heartbeat, matching something, you know, when it's that powerful, it really enters your body in a different way. And I wanted um, to kind of like, it's not about taking over the viewer's body. That's like the first thing that came to mind. It's not about taking over, but I really wanted to like enter their bodies, have my artwork enter their bodies in that way, in a way that wouldn't be possible um, if it was just, they were just looking at something flat on the wall or even, you know, walking through an installation. Even if they're in it, it's not in them. And I wanted it to be in them. Well, I mean, every, oh. I have a question in terms of this idea of entering and in them. Would you talk about, or is there a spiritual dimension to that? Or is it just a I think there is, but I don't think that I have a very strong language to describe that. Um, but I do think that looking for you know, the escape, the something else, the something there can often enter, you know, or at least sound like I'm entering, you know, a kind of spiritual one because I'm looking for something that's very much undefined that does not exist on this planet that, you know, but I don't, I'm not sure that I've developed a very strong language for talking about that. Well, I think um, that might conclude our conversation. Um, but I want to say thank you for, again, for inviting me to be in dialogue. Um, Can you say a bit about continuity before? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said a little bit about the music. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I mean, I think the most obvious layer is the color black. Mm -hmm. um, that every time you have an installation, it's draped and bathed in the color black. You paint the walls, um, the furniture. I, I'm even thinking about um, your store, your storefront installation where all the clothes were black. Um, so that's, I think, one. Yeah. And then spirituality in your last exhibition at Southern Exposure. You, I mean, the, the like Christian, Christianity was a huge influence. And so I think Lynn's question about how you think about spirituality as a means to escape, I think, like, I feel at least this undercurrent of spirituality. Oh, to add to that, I'm sorry, I dodged part of your question and missed part of you answering yours and that too, is that the next project is very much about that. So I will develop a language to talk about it soon. I just don't have it. About spirituality. Well, it's about transcendence. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, does that, does, it, does yeah, that satisfy thank you, you? Thank you, thank okay. you. I appreciate yeah. your generosity. I, I pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Um, to those of you who may have not been able to see the exhibition, you can listen to the record upstairs and you can buy the record from, from you directly. I think yes eventually there will be a buying page on simonebailey.com but right now it's just for me in person or at all is carrying it now and i think a couple of other local stores will be carrying it very soon too go see the show maybe you can look at it with fresh eyes after this conversation um, and dive into the lore of the maroons <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you